So odometry is a pretty amazing capability exhibited by many, many organisms. You do it regularly when you sort of somehow remember how far you walked without necessarily explicitly counting your walking. We have come to understand a lot with regard to odometry in the literature for organisms <coughs> generally speaking. Most recently has been the discovery of the peculiarity of the ant when in fact can do odometry backwards. Think about what this means. All biological systems, if they go off to forage, must come back home. To do that, they have to be mathematically reasonably precise. They are counting their steps. They're counting something. They're monitoring something. And the recent discovery with the ant is, well, normally they go forward when they come back home. But if they found something very big, they have to use their arms like this and come backwards. It makes no difference to their measurement, which has caused a bit of a puzzle because we figured the ants were doing it by means of the visual system. But they're not actually using their eyes in this particular case. I'm about to examine such issues with regard to Berkeley, Harkin, Golubitsky, and with good fortune, Magoo. Great name. Berkeley's hypothesis. Locomotion activity as such measures distance. It requires special kind of, I'm going to have to be over here I think somewhere, I hope I'm not going to block, how about here? Here should be good, you excuse me? Yeah. It requires a special kind of perceptual constancy. Legged locomotion without vision must yield an invariant measure of distance despite, repeating the ant story, despite variations in manner of legged locomotion. Imagine this participant. She's going to walk from A to B with B signaled by the experimenter. She is blindfolded. She walks. When she gets to a certain point, she's told to stop, turn around, and walk back. That's walking odometry. But we could do this. We can have a run A to B, again B signaled by the experimenter, <coughs> and then from B walk distance A to B. If measure is step counting, if measure is step counting, feature integration or duration, feature integration is sort of picking up on a variety of cues and using that as your describer of what you've just done, or duration, you have some kind of clock then return distance should reflect outbound differences. But it doesn't. So in one case we had the person walking, in another case we had the person running. The number of steps are different, the speed at which things are happening are different, but the odometry is the same. Walk and run odometers are the same for humans. In what sense are walking and running the same? That's the advantage of being a scientist, isn't it? You can ask very peculiar questions. Right? In what sense are walking and running the same? Actually, you would not have asked this question if that piece of research had never been done. Because right? you would have intuited these are very different things. And odometry would be very different if I'm walking and running. Here's bipedal symmetry. For the primary gates, they have a certain kind of symmetry exhibited here, and you can see where walk and run sit. But we have also secondary gates. I like the secondary gates. They're very good when you've just come out of the pub. So for example, this is the hesitation walk. It's like, you know, you, it's, it's a funeral. That's the, That's the my authority on such. You have to alternate your feet. To do <laughs> She's been in the pub more than I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the gallop run. I'm not going to run, and the gallop walk, so they're more like this, aren't they? Yeah, aren't they like this? Yeah, they're there like you go. There, that's there, go. there you go, that's it, and you can do that slowly, if you, if you wish. And these are different... The walk is the wedding. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Or, the, or the funeral march. Right. <laughs> There's your choices. There's a base theorem which folks use to generate the right kinds of group theory, mathematics and so on, is uh, there are n legs, two n cells, four identical cells, ordinary different equation, differential equations, 
and they comprise the bipedal pattern generator. For D2 signals, uh, to legs that are identical up to phase shift. The Z2 signals to left and right, to the left and right limbs, have different waveforms. So these are a generic set of findings by primarily a gentleman called Golubitsky, an Australian scientist in biological systems. This is an example of what it means to characterize in a particular way. I have to say it's not straightforward to tell you how these uh, particular shapes are being determined, but they're based upon the actual locomotory patterns. So we'll just go with them for now. So the top one, you can see uh, step one is left, step two is right, step three is left, step four is right, person walking. And the thing below is the gallop walk. You want to demonstrate, Corella? I can demonstrate. My wife is demonstrating the gallop walk. <laughs> Here it comes. Here so this is the gallop walk. Two feet together. Step, bring them together. Step with the alternate. <laughs> and alternate, uh, the alternate limbs. And then you fall over. <laughs> Signals to legs identical up to phase shift for D2, that particular dynamical system as it were, the, the body functioning in a particular dynamical way in order to do the uh, walking and the running, and Z2 signals to left and right that have different waveforms. And here are the footfall patterns. The one on the right top, walking. The one on the uh, right bottom, not quite the gallop that walk. Is a gal that's that's a gallop walk yeah. Are you happy with that? I'm okay. happy with the gallop walk. The gallop walk has been authenticated. All right. <laughs> Authentic gallop walk. In what sense are they, are primary gates the same? And in, sorry, in what sense are primary and secondary gates the same? What have I shown you to start with? I've shown you an experiment in which where people do optometry by walking or they do it by running. The measure is the same in both cases. So we have the question, in what sense are primary and secondary gates of the same? And it's decided to show me that twice. What kind of odometer is the human odometer? The bigger question, the concept of measure report system. So here's some data. You have participants uh, walk out, that's the outbound distance, to some distance, and just as I showed you, you ask the participant stop. And then they have to return the distance. So they're blindfolded, there's no vision being involved here, just the activity of the limbs. And you can see that walk, walk, and run, walk do not distinguish. That's basically what we had sort of imagined from the, uh, one of the earlier observations. When R symmetry, when the report symmetry is not the measure symmetry, this is the gallop walk as the measure and walk as the report. Uh, this is the hesitation walk as measure and walk as the, report, as the report. And you can see these are identical despite the fact that one is gallop walk and one is the hesitation walk. So you've got different gates doing the measure. You come back with the same gate and there is no difference. The two gates are identical. But notice they're identical in the fact that they track each other by being far off the mark. And these are not accurate gates, but they're equally inaccurate. Is human odometry tied to uh, measure symmetry? Do lower symmetry gates measure poorly? These are the kinds of questions. So look here. Suppose we go to, there's something missing up here, but let's not worry. Suppose you go to gallop walk as measure, gallop walk as report, versus gallop run as measure, gallop walk as report. So look at the question. Is human odometry tied to the measure symmetry? Do lower symmetry gates measure poorly? Apparently not. Right? These are lower symmetry gates. And do they, um, is, is, it, uh, is human odometer tied to uh, measure distance? Yes. So the, these are second order gates. Again, we should slow down things. What the scientists are doing here is they're uh, looking at the patterning of locomotion in ordinary biological systems. They're taking advantage of what we can say about the group structure of these gates. We can say something about their uh, factualness with regard to monitoring and measuring the actual distance traveled versus not so doing. So over here what we had is gallop walk walk right? and these are very natural 
well, sort of natural gates. Mm -hmm. They're pretty damn good. But here all of a sudden you're doing uh, the gallop, walk, walk, gallop, walk, walk, as we should expect. And this one is gallop, run, gallop, walk. And now we see that these are c considered by nature as identical. The odometry is the same. One more time with feeling. We're looking at a, a strange appreciation of how to get around that's exhibited by probably all legged organisms. That is to say, there are gates that are to be had and you can move by virtue of them, but they have odometric consequences. Right? They have odometric consequences. These are very strange rulers that nature is using. <coughs> When M and R have the same symmetry, R distance equals M distance. When M and R, measure and report, just to be redundant, have different symmetry, then R distance does not equal M distance. Here's Berkeley. In the great, here we are at Berkeley. And Berkeley is understanding. His hypothesis, locomotion itself is the measure of distance. Is satisfied at the level of locomotion as measure and report and locomotion as report. That's Berkeley's hypothesis. What we're realizing it's satisfied only in a particular way. Here it is. Look down here. If I gallop walk out and gallop walk back, if I gallop run out and gallop walk back, I have my odometry. Nature is weird, <laughs> right? I mean, look at this. We're just, we're just looking at how organisms are getting about. Me included. All of these things can be done with me. All of these are actually are human subjects. But we could have done them with the ant. And if we knew how to do it for flying organisms, we could do it with the bee and others. So, apparently neither is the answer there. Now, here's a rather famous experiment we will look at which has already been uh, put on show today, as it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> the famous HKB. There's some variant yeah, of it, yeah, some variant. Right. And we can ask the measure report experiment with uh, uh, the, such a model. Model M and R is a couple dynamical si system, sorry, uh, a single MR instrument. And we can consider a, a principle of time translation invariance. If later circumstances can serve the conditions of earlier circumstances, then dynamics manifest earlier will be manifest later. And we're trying to do this through some kind of basic uh, HKB sort of intuitions. The dynamics of systems coupled in parallel approximate very closely dynamics of systems coupled in series. And we can uh, provide ourselves with a simpler appreciation of a couple of ways of looking at things. Um, this is when we've been looking at uh, go out measuring and come back to report. This is the odometry. But over here we can look at a very different kind of system which is also involving activity of the limbs of the body. So I could, for example, I could move these two things in phase, I can move them anti-phase. Two pendulums uh, if one pendulum is longer than the other, the eigenfrequency of this pendulum will be a bigger number, sorry, a smaller number, and the eigenfrequency of this pendulum will be a higher number. That is to say, you have a frequency difference in this particular case. And we might ask about the similarity here, the sharing of factors. Where am I? Right, I've got this chair here is a little bothersome, I've got to say. <laughs> And I'm an old guy, I'm as old as Max Allen probably, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> not quite. So understanding MR systems, our serial and parallel dynamics alike. And we'll try it with this procedure. Uh, the individuals in the three cases on the screen, they are busily swinging pendulums. The shorter pendulum is faster, that is it oscillates higher frequency in the comfort zone than a longer pendulum. It oscillates more slowly in the comfort zone. And if the two oscillators are the same, by definition, same size, they will be equal in their eigenfrequencies. We have an order parameter which is relative phase. The order parameter was made rather significantly important by the work of Scott Kelso some many moons ago, Kelso. Some many moons ago. 
<laughs> the potential function in question gives us a, oh sorry, the uh, function in question gives us a nice potential function and that's what these are. So this, was, this would be zero value, this is uh, 90 degrees, 90, yeah, pi, phi, no 180, what's 90? Confusing myself, right? And uh, these will be, uh, so purple is where the oscillators being wielded are <coughs> identical in eigenfrequency, and the yellow part is where the oscillator here in yellow is two different eigenfrequencies. So this is showing us the nature of the function, and we're showing here that uh, delta equals omega left minus omega right. You're again breaking the symmetry. Symmetry breaking, which is producing this shift. This is where the system is when its units are the same. The oscillators, the right and left hand oscillators are the same. This is when they're different. Same over here. When the oscillators are the same, zero, you're at zero. When they're uh, not the same, they've moved a slight, slight distance away. Different relative phase. The full motion equation in this case is given by this equation. The, 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 ch <laughs> the change in relative phase is given by those terms. And here are some examples of coupled serial events. Again, what we're looking at is uh, an oscillator with a particular... Not an oscillator, right? Now ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now I'm doing more. I'm just doing more. Measurement. Yeah, M is now measure and R is report and the symmetry here this is when the measure is uh, a symmetry kind of measure as we've been looking at and this is when it's a um, symmetry kind it's of measure yeah, yeah. my wife is necessarily <laughs> coaching me on this bit <laughs> right. so proceed to do so don't yeah. be don't be embarrassed <laughs> yeah. so the left one shows the yeah. symmetry of measure and report are both primary symmetries the right pair shows measure and report had the same symmetry, but those are both secondary symmetries. Under consideration is whether those two situations are equivalent to the middle guy up above, the, the guy whose two pendulums are the same. So they're in purple because he's in purple. So, the order, order parameter is relative velocity in this particular case. We have a potential function and we have a motion equation for this particular circumstance. And here, Professor Carello. <laughs> so now you have broken the symmetry between measure and report. Excellent. In, in a way that is analogous to the pendulum guys above. So this guy is in goldenrod. And in this case, measure is secondary symmetry, report is primary symmetry. And one would hope there's another color on the other side. <laughs> As requested. As requested. That would show, <laughs> again, a broken symmetry where the measure is primary and the report is secondary. So the suggestion here is that the possibility is that the serial mm -hmm. dynamics of the case at the bottom of the screen is going to be understood in the same way as the parallel dynamics of the case at the thank top. You, thank you very much. You'll get a high A grade for that. Is M symmetry R symmetry as a system? Again, not the system. M symmetry, R symmetry. If so the measure MR, symmetry MR and the, is the system. and, and MI is, system. is the breaking of the symmetry between the measurement phase and mm -hmm. the report phase is that to be understood in the same way as a detuning or an imperfection parameter? So here we have a case where M symmetry is greater than R symmetry. That means the D2 is greater than Z2 in its influence, and uh, likewise we have M symmetry is less than R symmetry, and in this case uh, Z2 is less. Z2 is less than D2. And what we have is walk, walk at the, in the middle and gallop, walk, walk. So you can see that um, in this particular experiment now where we're back to measure and report in locomotion, you can see that uh, when we have, again, uh, the gate going out and the gate coming back, walk, walk, or gallop, walk, gallop, walk, then you can see that the uh, particular arrangement of uh, return distance to outbound distance is one of one to one. And then you go to gallop walk, sorry, gallop walk, walk in uh, orange and walk, gallop walk in green and you can see now that they have been uh, pushed away, pushed away from the ideal particular locomotion. 
The MR attractor shifted by delta gate, like interlim attractor shifted by delta omega. And the question we ask is M symmetry, R symmetry detuning, a detuning, an imperfection parameter, is that what it's doing? And the answer is yes. Right? That's what it's doing. So in this particular case, as you make these simple violations, first of all, I was showing them to you in the context of odometry walking across land. But the way we then just picked up this kind of variable, put it into another context, again involving, as it were, oscillatory processes, again involving limbs that are oscillating. When you do that, you show that the same phenomenon is holding up again. So these asymmetries and symmetries are very important. They're playing a tremendous role in what dynamics will become evident. Let's look at inten intended speed differences affect MR system. Metric speed difference does not. So here we go. We have uh, participants. Participants here. You have uh, participants who are going to walk at around about 1.11 meters per second, I guess. We have no units. And, uh, and 1.53 as faster. So some people are walking like this and some are walking like this right and on the other side what you now have is some people are walking uh, running slow and some people are running fast but these are different speeds let's step back for a moment so we're going to look at a young lady running walking slowly and walking quickly and a young person running slow and running fast and this is what the outcome looks. They're, they're doing measure of distance one more time. They're measuring this way. So this is a meter. This person has been given a, a charge of walking at this speed. This person walking at this speed. These two people have the, the requirement of running at these speeds, slow and fast. And now we're asking, when they're doing their measurement of distance, and they're producing these distances, what we can see by uh, what's going on is that the particular pattern here, this is walking fast, slow, running fast, slow. Right? Walking fast, sorry, yeah, correct, well, walking fast here, so this is... So they're all primary they're gates. They're all primary gates. And the only difference yeah. is the yeah. intended yeah. speed. Yeah. So regardless of whether they're walking out, or running out, if they intend to do it fast, those yeah. things hang together. If they intend to do it slowly, those things hang together. So you get your overshoot and your under. Say it one more time with feeling, because this is rather important. So everything yeah. that they're yeah. doing is a primary gate by the gate symmetry analysis. But now you've given them an intention. Take this primary gate of walking and do it slowly or do it quickly. Take the primary gate of running, do it slowly or do it quickly. If you look at the actual speeds that are produced, they're, you know, so the, the fast ones are in fact faster. Than, mm -hmm. So the slow run is faster than the fast walk. But what you see is the intention to go slowly makes those two guys hang yeah. together. So the one that says 1.11 one, one 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 and the 1.86, those are hanging together just as the actual speed of 1.53 and 2.48 are hanging together. So it's the yeah. intended uh, speed that yeah. makes those things cohere and, and breaks the symmetry again, even though in, uh, in the group symmetry of the gates, mm -hmm. they are from the same, yeah. uh, the same yeah. I always say on this one, one more time with feeling, <laughs> right? because, you, you because you're looking, there, you're looking at uh, the nature of intended activities. The data pattern is not due to velocity as such but to the organization of gates of the same symmetry into slow and fast forms. So we're not looking strictly at quantities here because they're rather odd, aren't they? This person here has been invited to move slowly, take a slow walk. This per person here has been invited to take a slow run, slow just the qualifier, so it sticks them into a certain speed, right, which is considered by them to be fast or considered by them to be slow. And the consequence of this is to change the entire dynamics of the system. The data pattern is not due to velocity as such, 
but to the organization of gates of the same symmetry into slow and fast forms. A theoretical possibility worth pursuing. Parallel dynamics equals serial dynamics. Uh, here's the basic equation for the pendulum and here's the basic equation for walking out and running back. There it is for the Great Kelso experiment, fingers, and um, we're sort of hoping these things are all reflecting some fairly common deep themes of how the body is put together. And there it is with uh, people doing uh, the same kind of experiment where they are swinging their legs in seated positions. While looking at, while looking at each other. other. While looking each at other. each other. Visual. And here are people running, as you can see, outward and backward, whatever that is, blue and red, and on treadmills. And this is a person on using plungers on a skateboard. <laughs> Basically, you can see the generic principles at work here, and that ma doesn't matter much what the vehicle is. And I think this particular result we just looked at is quite stunning. Principles of coordination dynamics are quite general. I just want to add another weird phenomenon. So I've just given you something conventional, namely walking and running. These are things you do all, the, all day long. They are remarkable processes. They took millions upon millions of years to evolve right, in, their, in their elegant simplicity. But as we can see, a rich complexity underlies this simplicity. A very rich complexity. Let's look at memory. So memory performance is maximal when study and test are fully symmetric. Forgetting is consequent to breaking symmetry, to breaking time translation invariance. This is just a paraphrase of the great Magoo, great memory theorist from Columbia University. Anyone remember? Not remember. Anyone know? <laughs> <laughs> you, don't have to uh, you don't have to. You don't have to remember. <laughs> I have an old friend there who's about a hundred years old. Yeah. <laughs> so let's look at uh, a nice bit of adaptation. So we sort of. Um, worrying about things from the great uh, words of Magoo, a very famous American psychologist in the early part of the century, last century. So here's the baseline. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing movements here, I guess. The person is throwing a beanbag. The person bean bag. throwing a beanbag? That's uh, good to know. <laughs> this person is throwing a beanbag with, with a weighted arm, <laughs> weighted arm, and this one's throw, uh, throwing with a weighted arm and wearing glasses. Wearing prism glasses, right? Very, very important, prism glasses. <laughs> and uh, that yields an after effect. And you can see, here's the test. So what this is showing you here is the person's throwing is off target initially, but then comes on target. Correct, Gorilla? So you've got yeah. the in the baseline, you're establishing how accurate they can be throwing yeah, with yeah. the weighted wrist, right? And they're good all the time. There's yeah. just no problem throwing with the weighted wrist. There's no no need to adapt. Yeah. You put on the prism goggles, and as you would expect, that it diverts things, and so yeah. they have to get back on the target. Now you take off the prism goggles and you yeah, take off the weight, you. and that's <laughs> when you get your after effect. Get an after effect. And now all we do is put back on the wrist weight. No, 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 don't do that yet. <laughs> we put back on the wrist weight, which in the very yeah, beginning yeah. didn't do anything, but now you put back on the wrist weight and yeah. you get the latent after effect. So not only is the process of knowing how you walk and run a little weird, but also the process of prism adaptation and the like is a little weird. Again, requiring some rather intriguing theory. I also like this kind of finding. A number of these, by the way, this final little foursome that I'm choosing for representing Magoo, who was an intriguing inquirer about the nature of learning and the like, that these are universal phenomena. So we're looking here, what you're looking at is uh, what are they doing? They're learning a particular behavior. This is positive reinforcement. Where's my wife again? Yeah. 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 So I want you to, I want you to think that so you're going this way and going and here they're sloped. So they're learning. Yeah, I'm forget I'm forgetting the paradigm. The yeah. the two guys at the top, so the 
the pigeon standing on, so they're, they're supposed to learn to peck at yeah. the, I guess that's a purple dot as opposed yeah. to the red dot. So they, they're reinforced for pecking at the yeah. purple dot. And the guy who learns to do that on a flat surface, when you test him later on, so time good. passes, you test him later on, and he's standing on a flat surface, he's fine, he's good. He, so he has learned uh, to peck at the purple dot. Down below, yep. you teach him to peck at the purple dot while he is standing on a slanted surface, and then you test him while he's standing on a slanted surface, and he's fine, he's learned, uh, he, he has learned the discrimination. But if you teach him on a flat surface and test him on a slant, or teach him on a slant and test him on a flat yeah, surface, then, then. there the learning yeah. fails. So if the conditions of test are not symmetric with the conditions of learning, is that plus? So, that just means he got positively reinforced. Yeah. yeah. So the, the nature of this observation, which you will find in, I would say, in memory, learning and memory textbooks, mm -hmm. a little earlier in the century, our century, the 50s, 60s, these were commonplace. I'm not so sure if they are such in the more contemporary learning textbooks, but what they we're intending to point out, and a lot of this of course is coming from the German school of looking at ordinary animals in their ordinary surroundings, and uh, understanding more about the breadth of the conditions under which organisms went about their daily business. In comparison to that, uh, people were sort of just running things in, in the laboratory settings. Um, Skinnerian psychology probably was the extreme case, without, without any recourse to appreciating just the nature of the organism's ordinary surroundings and their behavior. And so this is sort of rather important. Uh, if, I, you know, if I learn it in one posture, then it will transfer if you put me back in that same posture. But if you put me in a different posture, I'm a different kind of guy. And that's you're asking well. them yeah. to discriminate yeah. colors. And you're doing, co yeah, While it's color, yeah. On yeah. The surface yeah. of yeah. a particular slant. Yeah. It doesn't, so it's not that the slanted surface is bad, nope. because if you test them on a slanted surface, they're fine. They're fine, yeah. But switch up the slant. Can I just ask, is there like, when it's slanted and the bird has a certain motion that gets to the, to the maroon color, if they then go flat and they continue that same motion, oh, yeah. that would get them to the red? But the experimenter, though, no, the experimenter is controlling the surface either this way or that way. And in the case of going from, from uh, learning, learning this way, see, learning this way, and, then, and, and if you learn here, then you're fine again here. Yeah, he's right. asking about the spatial yeah. arrangement of the pigeon relative to the circles. And I'm pretty sure it's probably left and right and counterbalance and all of that to, yeah. to yeah. take care of. It's not more reachable, yeah. for example, yeah. more easily yeah. reached from one slide. And are the colors very similar? You, so you chose those colors originally. Um, I, don't yeah, I have no idea. I yeah. it's, it's, it's a like long time ago. So you can make them very, very, I don't know pigeon yeah. color vision actually, <laughs> but you can probably make them very, very different and then yeah, uh, yeah. to get yeah. the real discrimination learning, you make them closer, closer, and closer to drive them nuts, but already but standing on the surface. Like, and here, of course, is a classic Pavlovian phenomenon. These, these phenomena have been known for some time uh, in the upper operational, no we don't say operational, okay. operant learning, in the operant learning field. Uh, these kinds of things would never be tested. This is being pushed by the uh, class of uh, scientists who worry about how organisms are going about things in the wild, a bit more of the more natural take on their ordinary lives. But this is very uh, most classic of all experiments in our science, right? This is Pavlovian learning. And here what you do is you extinguish and you change the context. Something Pavlov never did, bring the organism back in, but the context is different. So the same conditions of Bell and whatever that would follow it, the shock or what have you, uh, same conditions, but in very different settings. And when you do that, the change gets rid of the extinction. Okay, now performance is back to normal. But if you just wait a little while and put things back in the previous circumstance, the green circumstance, then you're back where you were. Mm. These are context-dependent phenomena. In the interest of trying to come to terms with the natural behaviors of natural biological systems, what one has to be 
tuned into or be willing to get tuned into is more understanding of what's going on naturally more understanding of what's happening in the wild of course the um, what's the school of thought that would do that the the ethology guys yeah so we would say the ethology troops have been trying to force this perspective for maybe 50 years now maybe more maybe longer some of us have been around that long and this is another beautiful one alarm call responsiveness if I can be developed isolated or imbrued here I am I can be developed isolated or imbrued uh, so you uh, teach me an alarm call right? you, you, you give me a responsiveness to an alarm call and the alarm goes through this and what you can see that um, whether or not I acquire this response uh, it depends on whether I was isolated or imbrued only when only when development equals test so I conditions so yeah. you, you, the chicks are either yeah. raised alone or they're raised in a bunch and the alarm call of the mother is, is going off <laughs> you know so they it's so they're chicken alarm calls so or they're duck alarm calls actually so it's sort of you know all right quack 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 quack, quack is the alarm call when you test it if you if it, <laughs> if it had been raised in isolation that then it will show the alarm call res uh, yeah. responsivity it will flatten so their alarm call responsivity mm -hmm. is that it actually flattens mm -hmm. so it's just, uh, not being seen by the hawk it will do the flattening response right. if again the yeah. conditions of development are symmetric with the conditions of test so if it was developed while isolated it better be tested while isolated if it was developed in the brood it better be tested in the brood otherwise they won't show otherwise the they won't show it if you teach it while it's uh, isolated yeah. and tested in a brood it won't show the response so the bottom line is the circumstances within which you learn something were bloody important <laughs> and on that I'm finishing and I thank my <laughs> my lovely assistant for all her help good <laughs> any yeah any questions any any suggestions for things yeah Scotty the use of the word symmetry with respect to the measure um, in contradistinction to the notion of a symmetry meaning an invariance under transformation yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. or in mathematics well yeah so, so what's, what's invariant groups, for yeah. example yeah but, I think yeah. the goal but what's the invariant over the two conditions yes. right it's yeah, what's recent, but the, yeah. with respect to gates so that's yeah. the Golubitsky and Pinto characterization of the gates is with respect with respect to group theory well, uh, Schoener and I, as you know, did the uh, quadrupedal gates, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you can lower the symmetries and get all the gates. Mm -hmm. But the symmetries only, uh, the groups only give you a classification of the patterns. Mm -hmm. Which patterns you see mm -hmm. are dictated by the dynamics. So, for example, in phase and antiphase are identical with respect to symmetry, but it's the dynamics that causes... Causes a difference, yeah. 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 So in this case, the measure, I'm still trying to, sorry. Um, yeah. The measure, the measure, uh, the measure symmetry has a big effect. Well, the, no, it's the, the MR system. The MR system. So is, is the symmetry of the two phases matching or not matching? Right. And that's what matters. So that's the symmetry. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. It's a true conditions match. Yeah. And yeah. then in the, the um, uh, does the parallel dynamics uh, tell us anything about serial dynamics? Uh, what you're seeing is the same kind of equation and even though this one thing is happening at the same time and this other thing is it takes a long time to develop but mm -hmm. still you see the same sorts of things mm -hmm. you get the uh, just as you get the phase lead and the phase lag depending on the um, eigenfrequencies of the pendulums you get overshoot and undershoot mm -hmm. depending on the symmetry of the gates if you have people do a cognitive task at the same time that they're doing the pendulums then you shift the attractor right uh, and uh, that yeah. is, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm thinking, it, it, yeah. and it exaggerates the detuning. Mm -hmm. So you get the phase lead and the phase lag as a function of the detuned pendulums. Mm -hmm. You have them do cognition at the same time, and that gets exaggerated. You, uh, on the treadmill, you can do that, and the treadmill odometry experiment. So you can get exactly the same overshoot and undershoot with the various gates. Now you have them do cognitions at the same time. 
and you will also get an exaggeration of the symmetry break. Mm -hmm. Any more questions on symmetry breaking and the like? Organisms on the planet are now safe. Now right, there's a question. Yeah, yeah. The boss. The boss wants. <laughs> well, uh, th this reminds me a lot of uh, sort of those classic Coxi 101 things you learn about uh, Tolving uh, studies of memory. And I think he had people remember mm -hmm. lists or items underwater. <laughs> Oh, yeah. water and then tested them under yeah. Yeah. water. Yeah, no, yeah, they were, those are early yeah, demonstrations. Kind of yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I wondered, uh, as yeah. we think yeah. about uh, the earlier talks, such as Tom's and, and others, can this give us some baseline to characterize what it is we desire of, of students who are learning mm -hmm. content? I mean, where, if these chicks or birds or what have you could reflect on their uh, in human condition, <laughs> if, uh, what what, what is, if if we take this as a baseline, and how should we characterize what it is that human students, uh, mm -hmm. learners do that that is uh, goes beyond mm -hmm. perhaps I yeah, think say yeah. superior. It seems yeah. to change the discourse, <laughs> to change the discourse of mathematics to discourse of learning. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. How, so how what what is that mm -hmm. thing? Well, maybe the question to everyone. What if we take this as a baseline, the pigeons, mm -hmm. you know, if you just tilt it, sorry, <laughs> cannot do. You'd hope that if you teach people, I don't know, addition, five plus three, then now it's, you know, eight plus seven, it's not, well, sorry, cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think what this is showing uh, is the, the fact that you get similar kinds of effects in these very different settings, and as well in the, the parallel dynamics, in, with the fingers, with the pendulums, with uh, arms, with people visually coupled, that, uh, and then you get this, the same sort of thing with the odometry, suggests some very powerful generic principles. And I think it changes the nature of what we take to be an understanding of a phenomenon. And as Scott had mentioned earlier, what counts is similarity. Right? So the importance of the, the functional dynamics is allowing us to characterize characterize these in a way that perhaps would inform the mathematics instructor about how do you set up the conditions mm -hmm. of uh, training and test? How can you exploit the importance of the symmetry breaking in setting up the conditions of training and test? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's related to mathematics education research one speaks of contrasting examples and changing, shifting the uh, the numerical items, so to speak, because the, the, when you say exploiting, we probably mean it pedagogically, that you actually want yes. to enhance the capacity yeah. to, yes. to implement new routines, even as the context yeah. changes. Yeah, certainly these, uh, these phenomena show us, and I think uh, among the things that Tinberg and company, if they had not got themselves over involved perhaps in using the, in, in the notion of instinct, what well, they're showing was the conditions were being manipulated and as you manipulated them you got this or that effect. And these manipulations are being made in the natural surround. So if you step in, interrupt the dynamics of that natural order and you get some outcome, which is different from what would normally occur, which would not normally fall out. And there are lots of these things around which are sitting there telling us that the principles behind learning are considerably more rich, considerably more complex than I think our textbooks to date, for those of us who have taught learning theory over the decades, our textbooks to date have covered. In fact, they really do so. I mean, they're dominated by uh, treatments of learning as if it's a merely, in these circumstances, you proceed to go through a certain set of trials, that can be put more nicely, and you end up with some particular kind of basic understanding. Uh, in these cases we see here is fairly dramatic and necessary behavioral consequences uh, are going to, as it were, be not of the right kind by virtue of you having fiddled with the symmetry, the natural symmetry behind the problem. Right, so, so clearly, these cases here are requiring that a certain symmetry is always you know, being left untampered. Right? Just leave it alone, leave it as is. As soon as you change it, then you see what's been sitting there for millennia undergoes a change. I mean, that's some of the remarkable consequences of this kind of work. Yeah. I think it also echoes a, a point that Scott had made in his talk about the unit of analysis. 
So, to, you know, what part of the system are you going to study? You don't want to just study, a, if it's really a system, you don't want to study just a part of the system. You need to have the entire thing to capture yeah. the loftiness yeah. of yeah. the phenomena. So, in the uh, odometry, it is the MR that is the yeah. unit yeah. of analysis. Yeah. And in these guys, presumably, it's the learning and the test, the training and the test phases that are the unit of analysis. So again, going into the teaching of mathematics, what is your unit of analysis? Because if you choose uh, wrong, you'll be sorry, and the phenomenon won't look uh, reliable. This resonates also strongly with certain implicit assumptions that go into curricular development, mm -hmm. which are, let us build from the mathematically simple to the mathematically more complex, which at times, as we see with uh, natural adultery go counter to the very phenological uh, resources that people, uh, students actually have. In particular, with respect to intensive quantities, those quantities that can be expressed as A over B, such as slope, <coughs> rise of a run, probability, de desirable out of sample, or, or, or speed, uh, uh, distance over time, etc. Uh, teachers and designers hesitate to begin from the thing itself, saying, well, first let's learn to measure distance. Now let's learn to measure the time. Now we have to even figure out what a, what a, a division is so to get a quotient. So we have to do all this prep work just so that you can even speak of a slope, whereas the kid just looks at mm -hmm. these two lines and mm -hmm. says, well, obviously this one is steeper than that one. Or with speed, going back to Piaget, they have a sense of, of well, you can, you can fool them, uh, Piaget in ways, uh, but they have a sense of one object moving faster than another. And then, but you think, oh, no, 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 you haven't yet taught them to measure distance and time, <laughs> let alone how to divide one by the other. But they already have all these natural mm -hmm. resources, as we see with the odometry, they can do very clever things. Mm -hmm. And yet we hang on to uh, building things incrementally in the logical, mm -hmm. mathematical mm -hmm. uh, ascendance of complexity. It's yeah. a curious phenomenon. Yeah. Curious. A very curious phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> and and, and I, I think she's done as well. <laughs>